Far too many good people continue to faithfully sing the hymns, heed the rules, or try to, bless the food, and pay the tithes more out of the subconscious, out of subconscious duty or fear than out of the happiness found in the supreme mutuality. This is a word you use a lot. You call it the missing link, mutuality. Yeah. Talk to me. I borrowed that term actually from John Bradshaw, uh, who wrote the book, Healing the Shame That Binds You. Mm -hmm. And he borrowed it from a philosopher, um, Erickson, I believe. But I saw Eric it, Erickson? Yeah, but I, I saw it differently. It, I saw it, I began to understand what, what mutuality, well, first of all, it's a bonded relationship, first as a child with a parent. And in that relationship, that individuality emerges out of a mutuality. As he, as he said, it is uh, in the context of we-ness that I-ness develops. Mm -hmm. So the, the being is established, we're established as individuals in a mutuality. But if the mutuality is dysfunctional, the child ends up feeling alone and, and they assume the shaming messages of life and, and the definition, the end result is, I'm not much of anything. We find out who we are by what others mirror back to us. Exactly. If we have a really good parent, then we turn out a lot more healthy. Mm -hmm. But being born again is all about being restored back to the ultimate mutuality. I call it, I call God now the ultimate parent. The perfect parent. The, perfect the only parent. one who's perfect. Jesus, Jesus came, that he, and he, he said this prayer to the Father, that they may know you, that they may know you, Father, and, and eternal life. And the, and, and, and the full meaning of life. And, and the meaning of life is missing in so many Christians' lives because they haven't met heavenly mutuality. They haven't been brought back to the Father. And if I keep, can keep going on for just a minute, the whole mission of Jesus on this earth, the Lord Jesus, my Lord and your Lord, who saved us, was to bring us back home to the Father. To restore that relationship. Yes. Parent, child. He didn't want it to end with him his mission was to bring us to him, to the Heavenly Father again. Mm -hmm. And when he leaves on earth, he says, now I'm going home to my Father and to your Father, he says. Oh, and, yes. And so, what's that mean? We find our beingness, our, our, the way we were intended to be and were in Eden, he restores back to us again so that we can live right now on earth with a sense of peace about who we are, with a sense of validation and with wonderful purpose. No place for panic attacks when you have that mutuality. We don't have time for the whole vision and dream God gave you both in one day. Very profound. Is that when you first realized that this issue that was causing such dramatic physical symptoms was rooted in a misunderstanding of who God is and all he wants to be in your life. Well, it was preceded by a scriptural journey. And when I saw in Romans chapter 8, I think verse 15, that we have been given a spirit that doesn't lead us again to fear, that, but we have been given the spirit of sonship, daughtership. We have been given, we've been given a new position as sons and daughters of a king. There's no more, more place for fear because we call, it goes, goes on to say, he's our daddy, he's our father, and he's the king. And so, that makes us? That, that makes you princess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no problem with that. <laughs> you, you As my like, co-host well knows. You, you look like one. Oh. I'm, I'm very serious about that. There, there's, there is no greater honor than being a daughter of a king, of the king, or a greater honor of being a son of the king. I mean, can a president have more honor than that? No, Do you not, know, not unless they're born again sons and daughters. I tell you what pops right into my mind. Years ago, speaking at a women's weekend and some really wonderful mature women from the church I was attending and I thought, what am I going to share that's going to be eye-opening for them? What do they not know? And I said, Lord, by your spirit, do something special for them. I don't think it's gonna come from me, but one of those very women came to me after. And she said, you know, I always believed that I lived in the castle, but I saw myself as the servant, not the princess. Oh, so many Christians do. Bless their hearts. I know so many leaders, and I love them, and they're, 
saved and they're wonderful Christians and they're doing a great job. But so many <clears throat> needing validation in their own in their own heart and their own life and and, and struggling because they, they can see themselves as the servant, but they can't see themselves as a man who rides a white horse, mm. a, a soldier, one of great confidence, one who knows who they are and is completely a joy with who with who they are. I loved what you said. Oh, there's so many, so much good theology in here. You call uh, the Garden of Eden hell's horrendous hoax. And uh, eh, when, they le when they left Eden. When they left, when, when they bought the, the enemy's when they bought deception. The, when they bought the lie. Um, we are perfect in our Father's eyes, but you make this point. We, it, we're perfect in our being holiness, not yet in our doing holiness. That's a journey. Do you know, that's a concept. I was talking with a young Jewish woman on the plane yesterday coming up here from Montana, and she said, I really struggle with that. She said, I just can't figure it out. I can't keep up with the law. I can't do it. I said, well, we, we are perfect in his eyes, but we're in the process of getting better. And there's a difference between actually being holy and being considered perfect. Just like I consider my children absolutely perfect. They don't do it all perfectly, mm -hmm. but I love them so much I can hardly stand it. Mm -hmm. And I would never, never give up my children. Their inheritance is, their name, their inheritance is theirs. It's always theirs. Their it's, behavior can't disqualify them no, from the family. Exactly. So the difference between seeing that, that being holiness and doing is so important. And by the way, if we understand the being, who we are, we're, and not a worm, we're going to be motivated to be the holy being. Did you hear what he said? He said, not a worm. Yeah. That's sort of the alternative self-view. Yeah, so if you think you're a princess, acting like a worm is an Excuse me, I don't think it. I know it. <laughs> David, thank you. I know. Some, it was a journey for actually, me, too. Actually, some of the men here already told me that, that you felt that way. <laughs> and that's perfect. That's what you should feel. That's what every Christian should feel. They should all know that they are not a worm. And if you know, if you think like a worm, you'll act like one. If you think like a prince, you'll act like one. What do you do when and if you have moments where old fears and insecurities try to creep back? How do you respond? I sp in Romans it says, those who have their minds set on the spirit, they have this. They are set on the things that he desires, and I just remind myself constantly of who I am. I'll say, sometimes I'll be in a shower getting nervous about the day, and I'll say, wait a minute, you're a son of the king. David, you're a son of the king. And so I, I, it's a, a matter of reminder, and pretty soon, though, it becomes natural to you, and you begin to glow with it and feel with it. And, and it, it's not about being proud. It's about being humbly proud. It's knowing it, whose you are. It, exactly, and we used to tell our kids all the time, Walk with your head high, your nose low. Mm, that's good. Walk in humility, but walk with dignity. Ride the white horse. You'd return to pastoring after all of this, and very soon after, which is amazing, another part of the story. If you would lead in a prayer for the person who wants to make that great transition. I hate that bumper sticker. I'm just a forgiven sinner. Boy, that's not the whole story, is it? No. <laughs> that's before we find Jesus and before we find the Father. Would you? Yeah, I'd be proud to, honored to. There's a lot of you out there that, um, that are just needing to know that God loves you so much he can hardly stand it, that he's proud of who you are doing, what you're doing today. He really loves you so much, and he wants you to appropriate your daughtership, your sonship. He wants you to take it. It's yours. It's a gift to you. Just take it. Just like you receive Jesus into your life, take the Father into your life and be his daughter and be his son. Father in heaven, I pray so much today that the children in this earth, all of them would come back to know you. Like the prodigal that moved away, that they would come back to you and they would have the ring put on their finger once again, the ring of the signet of importance that you would give them that royal ring, that covering, that you would let them see the crown that is on their head as the glorious children of God. I just pray for each one out there today 
and I believe you're going to, going to do it. I just know I've seen it so many times before. I believe you're going to do it today. I thank you for the great pleasure and honor to pray for them. Let it be. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, from distorted self-perception, from so much woundedness to honor, that's the journey you'll take if you read They Ride White Horses, The End of the Search for Significance. David Graham, thank you for taking the manuscript off the shelf. Thank you for having me today. We can help you further, perhaps, by praying with you on any of our prayer lines. Just call the number on your screen. We're always here for you.